So let's add one more point about uh, forcing ocean models with fluxes or forcing atmospheric models with fluxes since atmospheric only mo atmosphere only models will need uh, boundary conditions uh, at the bottom as well. Um, so we end up uh, talking about what are called mixed boundary conditions and they are based on the differences in the heat and uh, freshwater flux forcing of the ocean and the uh, resulting changes in the ocean. So this is the schematic illustration of temperature and salinity anomalies at the surface uh, ocean and the different responses of heat and water fluxes. A warm SST anomaly causes an increased ocean to atmosphere heat flux which removes the anomaly. This is very uh, common, very typical, uh, except there are a few places where the atmosphere is actually uh, warmer than the ocean. Those are special places. Uh, but on the other hand, a SSS anomaly does not influence the amount of precipitation in the atmosphere. So if you have evaporation, you create higher salinity or you can converge salinity. You may have freshwater uh, fluxes coming from the rivers and reducing salinity and so on. But they don't have a direct relation uh, with the local uh, precipitation if you think in terms of atmospheric temperature and ocean temperature versus atmospheric salinity and uh, freshwater flux in the uh, atmosphere. Uh, there are indirect effects of course if you put rainfall on the ocean it tends to stratify the ocean, make the mixed layer shallower, can warm the atmosphere and have a feedback but that's more through the mixed layer structure temperature effect rather than direct salinity effect. So this difference is always something that has to be dealt with. So if you have a model simulation uh, and you ran it for uh, a long time to equilibrium typically which is the purpose of these kind of relaxation uh, Newtonian cooling type of fluxes, uh, flux formulation where you ignore the heat capacity of the uh, atmosphere being very uh, small. So let's say you have salinity flux from the ocean to the atmosphere uh, as a function of salinity given by this uh, coefficient of exchange and S minus S star where S star is uh, a uh, equilibrium uh, salinity you reach. Uh, let's say with proper forcing you integrate for a thousand years and you reach uh, equilibrium for temperature and salinity. In that case, in order to account for the, the fact that ocean models uh, have these uh, different uh, impacts in heat and fresh water, uh, often this 8.13 uh, which is similar to the heat flux condition uh, as a Newtonian cooling is replaced by a constant flux. Okay, so here uh, the equilibrium uh, salinity S infinity is taken and the freshwater uh, flux uh, or the salinity flux is set to ds star times S infinity minus S star where S star is the equilibrium uh, salinity that is reached. Uh, sorry, S infinity is the equilibrium salinity that is reached and S star is the specified salinity. So this actually ends up uh, kind of creating a uh, imbalance of sorts where the S star can drift uh, and has no relation to the uh, P minus E flux that's happening as you integrate forward. So when you combine these two fluxes together that's called the mixed boundary uh, conditions as we say here and uh, this has specific uh, outcomes when you make long integrations you end up with uh, bifurcating solutions uh, because the freshwater flux can arbitrarily become uh, uh, large or small creating uh, changes in density, deep water formation and so on and you can jump from one state to the other. We'll look at something like that later on but just keep in mind that salinity flux is very different in the ocean than uh, the atmosphere because there is actually no exchange of salinity with the atmosphere unlike heat but salinity in the ocean is affected by exchange of fresh water with the atmosphere. So there is that 
detail that has to be dealt with. So model biases uh, end up being created by various processes, even in a coupled model. This is looking at observed uh, December, January, February rainfall from uh, a satellite and other uh, combined estimates. This is from TRIM, so it's just from the Tropical Rain Measuring Mission satellite. And if you look at the uh, model output for the same uh, season, so these are some, let's say, long simulations in which you make climatology of uh, the model precipitation, you can clearly see there are tremendous differences in the amounts of rainfall for the same scale. You can see the uh, mix of yellow and red here, whereas it's all mostly red here. But more importantly, you have this tilting South Pacific convergence zone in the model, whereas uh, in the observations, whereas in the model, you have a tilting structure, but also this very strong zonal structure with significant amounts of rain. And this region is basically a cold uh, region with SSDs being uh, quite cold because this is a strong upwelling region and stratus clouds as well. So these kind of biases uh, are uh, then going to feed back into other uh, aspects of the coupled model behavior. For example, the winds, the uh, circulation uh, in the ocean, the uh, uh, poleward transports in the ocean because of the, the trade winds and so on can all be affected. So uh, something th in the coupled model, we don't have to worry about salinity boundary condition, heat flux boundary condition, freshwater flux boundary condition and so on separately because in the fully coupled ocean atmosphere model, you just give it top of the atmosphere radiation and the model is internally computing uh, everything. It's computing winds, precipitation, evaporation, it's carrying ocean salinity, it is doing salinity budgets uh, with the precipitation and evaporation. It's only in the forced ocean models that you end up with these issues of mixed boundary conditions uh, and uh, the differences in uh, salinity budgeting, uh, trying to be sure that it's consistent with the freshwater budget and so on. But even when you have full coupled model, this is a full coupled model from the uh, UK Met Office and uh, there also you can have biases in terms of energy balance resulting into wind uh, uh, biases, ocean current biases, ocean structure biases, ocean temperature biases which then feed back to atmospheric biases. So you essentially end up with artificially creating uh, flux biases because if you look at the model fluxes they correspond to the errors in freshwater fluxes uh, sea surface temperatures and so on and so forth. So the temperature bias is shown here uh, for the CMIP-6 models which are the latest crop of IPCC models the report being released now the assessment report 6 uh, is coming out now um, and you can see that these are the biases in the model upper 100 meter temperatures uh, uh, for uh, compared to observations, observational estimates, and this is from the CMIP-5 crop of models, which was the previous report, uh, assessment report 5, released in 2014. Uh, the biases are almost similar. There are improvements in various features. Maybe there is improved. There are changes here, reduced biases here, for example. Uh, compared, I don't know. It's not clear, but nonetheless, there are also vertical structure biases associated with it. So this averaged box here is compared for CMIP-6 and CMIP-5. So people go into these sorts of details to understand how the El Nino has changed, how the El Nino and monsoon relation has changed, how the Indian Ocean Dipole or the uh, tropical Atlantic biases have changed and so on and so forth. So here, for example, there is there is very warm uh, sea surface temperature bias or upper atmosphere, upper surface layer uh, temperature bias here and here. This is, remember, this is climatologically the colder region than here. So if you make it much warmer here than colder here, most models have what is called a reversed gradient. So models have warmer sea surface temperatures here than here, whereas here there is typically what is called a cold bias. So temperatures are colder than observed here. 
um, and not so bad here. And obviously, if you remember, there are sea surface temperature gradients which relate to zonal winds and so on. There is obviously feedbacks which feed back into the vertical structure, El Nino, and so on and so forth. So when we look at the coupled models next, we will discuss uh, some of the uh, details in terms of uh, other biases uh, that result and look at what are the coupled modeling issues that relate to AC interactions that we have been discussing so far. Uh, in general, whether you are forcing the atmosphere only model with sea surface temperatures or the ocean model with all the fluxes, momentum, uh, heat and freshwater fluxes, uh, those experiments are never going to be perfect but they are much cheaper to run and they are very good for understanding many processes. Uh, atmospheric model with sea surface temperature forcing uh, runs very fast without the ocean coupling and uh, it reaches equilibrium pretty quickly because the atmosphere has low heat capacity um, and it is very useful for studying many uh, things, many processes, many atmospheric responses to temperature trends, temperature changes uh, and so on. Uh, the same with at, uh, the ocean but forced ocean uh, reaching equilibrium for in a thousand year simulation and then having to do mixed layer, mixed boundary conditions and so on lead to uh, ca many caveats. You have to be very careful and make sure you understand what you are doing with these forced ocean models. For example, if you wanted to do ocean biogeochemistry, then a forced ocean model is very important and very uh, useful if you wanted to do heat budgets, understand how uh, Eastern Pacific, Western Pacific uh, heat budgets work in El Nino and non-El Nino conditions. <coughs> then having forced ocean can produce many fast and useful simulations uh, as, so as long as you are aware of the caveats of prescribing fluxes in uh, various forms. Okay, I will leave it there.